you start on day one of your training at 100% effort, day two is not going to look like 100% effort. You're mm. probably going to get 100% and then we're going to be 60, 60, 60 for the rest of the week. Can we get 80% uh, on day one and then can we get another 80 on day two and three? And then over the whole week and the month, we'll have done more work. Through your coaching, you're writing our, our mainline class. Yeah. You've done the same back in the UK. I'm interested to see what the amazing way of looking at developing a program for a larger population that has so many different abilities, needs, and goals. I've always maintained that writing like a good group program is much harder than writing an individual. You sort of changed career. You started out being a lawyer and then, then you got into coaching. Go coach the classes first thing in the morning, get my suit on, go to work, finish, wow. get my suit back off, come back to the gym, coach in the evening. During in the course of that, I kind of realized that I just did not want to be a lawyer. If you're more powerful, if you're more explosive as an NFL player, you're going to be more powerful and more explosive doing a barbell clean or a snatch. Yeah. The emphasis on some of the power athlete stuff is super beneficial for people just doing CrossFit. It's a, almost like a more accessible way of getting better at a certain quality. You want to get more powerful, but maybe the limiting factor is a beginner is that your technique's not as good on, say, a power clean. But replace that with, all right, we're going to go sprinting in. So long as the intent is there, you're still going to get these changes and adaptations that make you more powerful. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Inner Fight podcast. Today, we are diving deep into the world of fitness and CrossFit training. My guest is someone that those of you that come to Inner Fight may know. Yes, it is our performance coach, Dan Campbell, who, for those of you that don't know, actually used to be a lawyer. There we go. It's actually on his profile downstairs, but random fact that you might be interested in. He's obviously now a key part of our coaching team here at Inner Fight, and he is the man responsible for the mainline class program. So anyone that likes it, loves it, hates it, or makes them really tired and wants to speak to someone about it, you can always speak to me, but Dan is the man. His journey is actually super inspiring. It started when he discovered CrossFit through a colleague. He then went on to pursue his level one certification and a load of other certifications to get him qualified. And he always had this almost desire urge, satisfaction to help people. And that's really how he explains how he got into coaching. He's also, which I'm sure you will agree, and he might not like me for this in the introduction, he's quite geeky about the way he does things. He's thought out, he plans things. As you see in the show, he understands how to really zoom out and plan on a long-term level to achieve things. We talk about his approach to training and also his approach to coaching, which you'll not be surprised is very, very similar. He has an incredible long-term philosophy that we go through. And yes, as I said, quite a method methodological philosophy and approach to how he does his programming. Nothing happens by mistake. Towards the end of the show, he also gives us a small insight into what we might expect in the next hell week. It's definitely worth listening all the way to the end. This is episode number 940 of the Inner Fight Podcast. As I always say, no matter where you are in the world, thanks a lot for listening. Let's jump into today's show. Dan, I've got to kick this off. What is the hardest workout you have ever done? Wow. Um, <laughs> hardest workout? Uh, probably um, it was the, uh, it was originally a CrossFit football one, the Kalsu. So you got the yeah. 100, 100 thrusters for time, 60 kilos, but every minute, five burpees. Just. Yeah, that's hard. Just a slog. Is it, is the RX weight 60 kilos? Yeah. 100 yeah. thrusters at 60 kilos. That's at least four days of not being able to have a shit <laughs> properly. Yeah. <laughs> just just, uh, just crushing. <laughs> when did you do that? Early days of, of doing CrossFit, maybe like seven years ago. Yeah. Um, you, yeah. When you first get into it, obviously you have a go at everything, don't you? And uh, 
you, you get humbled. <laughs> you learn some things about yourself. I guess that's an interesting one to go to as well, mate. Talk a little bit about how you actually got into CrossFit. And, and also, some people might have read it downstairs. Some people might have heard the story of how you, you sort of changed career. You started out being a lawyer and then, then you got into coaching. So give us your induction or life in CrossFit and as a CrossFit coach. Take as long as you want as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think like a lot of people, CrossFit was like something I got into as like a replacement for like after rugby. Um, a, a guy I used to work with, uh, the first law firm I worked at did it and uh, asked me, you know, do you want to come down give it a go? It's probably up your street. So that was kind of my yeah. uh, proper introduction. I, I had, I'd read about it and I'd actually had a go at a, a CrossFit workout in like the Virgin Active Gym. It was one of those <laughs> things where I was just like, like, how are these people doing this so fast? Me doing like strict toes to bar and things like that. Um, so yeah, that was that was my introduction, um, and yeah, like I said, at the, at the time I was working in a, in a law firm. Um, kind of went down the rabbit hole as like a as just like a member of the gym. It, interestingly, uh, it was Simon Jones's gym mm -hmm. in Manchester, um, and then maybe six nine months in, I was like, okay, I'll go do the go do the level one. Um, be interested in doing some coaching, that kind of stuff. Mm. Um, started out as a as an intern as an intern at, at Train, which was Sam Briggs's gym in Manchester. So, was an intern there for a little bit. Um, so I used to, you know, get up, go coach the classes first thing in the morning, get my suit on, go to work, finish, wow. get my suit back off, come back to the gym, coach in the evening or, or train in the evening. Um, and then it was kind of one of those things that. Like, during the course of that, I kind of realized that I just did not want to be a lawyer. Like, you know, I would wake up and just kind of dread going to work. And this, I was like, this is not for me. Um, and yeah, bef before I'd kind of done my law degree, I actually wanted to be a PE teacher and I kind of got kind of uh, encouraged uh, to, to kind of pursue law. Um, and then I was like, you know what? This is kind of like being a PE teacher, um, or kind of <laughs> PE teacher for adults. For adults, yeah. I was going to say. Yeah. So uh, started uh, kind of exploring that as a potential way out. Um, one of the coaches at train at the time, we kind of like took uh, like a mentorship role for me, a guy called Craig Massey, um, and then we kind of came up with a bit of a plan, like how I'm going to move out of working in a law firm. I'd, by this point, I'd been working in law for nearly f like five years um so i had this like plan it was gonna be like a year-long transition and then about a month later um it came to me and was just like we've been we've got this opportunity to to purchase and open another gym that we can't say no to um but we don't have any coaching staff for it like what do you think um so this was in like november uh, so on the first, well, sorry, the second or the third of January, they opened they opened this gym, and I was straight in there wow. coaching full time. So I basically, just coached every like every hour available. Um, yeah, just amazing. Got they they kind of made me that offer, kind of worked it worked it out, mm -hmm. and then like a week later, went into work and was just like, I handed him a notice, I'm out of here. It's interesting because it doesn't surprise me at all that from your personality that you had a plan that you could see what's going on and that suits, that seems to suit your personality type. Like yeah. you don't just, yeah, okay, fuck this. It's Friday, I'm done. <laughs> Monday, I'm, I'm changing. Like you, you, you think about things and you process things. So it's yeah. gone from a plan to the next, but the next week, the whole thing has changed. Yeah, yeah, that was uh, out of my comfort zone. Yeah, uh, totally. <laughs> Those kind of things, but yeah, I'm uh, fairly, uh, logical, yeah. like like to have a bit of a you know an idea where I'm going and, and why and kind of steps along the way. Um, maybe that, maybe that's kind of inherent, but then also as a result of like law is like you know some critical thinking, yeah. pulling things apart, having a bit of a plan, a bit of a structure. So yeah. But you, so you had the plan in place and then flipped the whole thing, flipped yeah. the script. And, and then it got accelerated by about nine months. <laughs> wow. How did for. I mean, this is 
off what we what we wanted to speak about, but I think there's a lot of people that are probably in quite a similar position where they're like, right, I want change, and I'm the same. I'm a, I'm, I'm a thinker or I'm a planner, and you know that what you said really resonates with them. And they've got a year plan or a nine month plan, but it's almost because I see this quite a lot with people. It's almost like a it's a rolling plan. Mm. It never really it never really happens. So what when you got the call from Craig and said we've got this gym, what was your decision making process to go screw the nine month plan? I'm happy to crack on and and do it. Like what pushed you to do it straight away? I suppose it's kind of like two things. The one that I was just like not particularly happy with mm. work and obviously it you know probably naively before that I thought it doesn't really matter if I don't enjoy my job that much like earn a good living and then and you see lots of people do that they kind of like live for the weekend kind of yeah. thing um, but then uh, I suppose it was a quick like can can I make this work um, and you know it was like okay it'll be a little bit tight kind of financially um, but I can make that work uh, I'll have to work really hard, but I don't. I don't mind that either. So, you know, it was. It wasn't perfect. It yeah. wasn't fully kind of, uh, you know, completely lined up. But I knew that sort of, you know, seventy five percent of it would be all right. I was like, the rest will take care of itself. Just if you don't do it now, like, you know, when are, when are you going to do it? You might, you've got this opportunity. It's not going to come along again. Um, so, you know, just. Take, just dive in, just go for it. It's interesting what you've just said there. And if people are listening, just go back a minute because all what you did is you highlighted what you're actually really good at. And you highlighted two or three things that were in your favor. Yeah. And you just went all in on those. And like you said, it's not, it's not 100%, but maybe it's 70%. And yeah. I'm just going to do it. Yeah, like it's, you can be a little bit kind of perfectionist about these things, but it almost like stops you from, from doing them um, by kind of almost over analyzing it too much yeah. and having almost being like too much of a control freak about things. Um, so kind of relax on that front and, you know, get the, the, the big pieces kind of lined up and then figure out the rest as you go. <laughs> yeah, Cause you see it, don't you? I mean, and, and laws are laws an interesting one as well, because you start in, as in a junior role and, you know, when I become, X or when I become a partner or when I become on this level, then this is going to happen. Yeah. Oh, how long is that going to take to, to line up? And when you actually get there, is it going to line up? But you had 70% lined up and some people might go, well, I'm not even close to 70%, but then you've just gone to your strengths and you've just gone, well, you know, and the, the best one I love is I, I'm not scared of hard work. So yeah. I'll just crack on and it'll be all right. Yeah. I think, um, you know, there's a lot to be said. Just, uh, just get your head down and, and get work hard at things, and they'll figure it out. You know, you might not be as a coach. Maybe you're not as well known as someone else. But if you consistently show up and, and train people well, and they enjoy and they see progress, then it speaks for itself. <laughs> It's uh, the easiest equation in fitness that yeah. people kind of ignore. <laughs> yeah. That, <isn't> it? <laughs> yeah. CrossFit football. How did you land on CrossFit football's site to get that workout, Kelsey? Just, I think it was uh, someone else who I uh, was friends with, trained with uh, from a rugby kind of background as well. Um, was like, oh, you should, you should check this out. Like, it's cool. Like, it's maybe a little bit more towards that kind of heavier side of stuff. You've got this kind of like, these kind of like power focus, which is always something that I've enjoyed, like with the rugby, uh, athletics, that kind of stuff. So um, that immediately kind of imp appealed to me. Um, and probably then, and as, as from, from then, as always kind of uh, had like a theme running through all of my kind of training um yeah just because i like it and i'm all right at it so it's, it kind of keep, keeps it it's one of the 
oldest sort of sub franchises, franchises if we call them that, mm. of CrossFit. John Wellborn, CrossFit yeah. Football. It doesn't really exist now as CrossFit Football. No, it was power, power athlete. Power now, athlete think, yeah. now. But it was always quite interesting in the early 2000s because John Wellborn, obviously, he played in the NFL, right? Yeah. So he's, he's a pretty legit athlete and yeah. he was <laughs> doing stuff for athletes that was, like you said, was more at athletically focused, whether it was for football or whether you need explosiveness in rugby, it, it was all focused on that. Yeah. It's interesting how, how it kind of split from CrossFit though. Yeah, um, I suppose kind of uh, the kind of sport of CrossFit took CrossFit kind of in one direction whereas that kind of uh, CrossFit football as a, something to, to train people for other sports yes. kind of uh, kind of differentiated to some extent and like I, I still think you know the basis of CrossFit still tick a lot of the boxes that the basics of strength and conditioning for team sports all all have but CrossFit football kind of has that those, those other elements that maybe we don't do as much of in yeah. in traditional CrossFit. So people tend not to sprint that much. They tend not to not to jump, um, do these kind of, uh, you know, they, they still get the kind of the traditional power stuff with uh, with kind of Olympic lifts and that. But um, yeah, that, that other element that I think is quite beneficial for, for quite a lot of people. Um, but it's weird because everything that John Wellborn put or was bringing to CrossFit under CrossFit football had a massive carryover into being better at CrossFit. Mm. So if you're more powerful, if you're more explosive as, as, a, as an NFL player, mm. you're going to be more powerful and more explosive doing a barbell clean or a snatch. Yeah. Like it's just, that's, that's why I, I, I wasn't really close to it when it all changed and when he became power athlete and obviously someone's fallen out with someone but the actual the premise that crossfit football was built on and bringing a real athletic background into crossfit for me was genius yeah and it should stay yeah and and it's the same because box jumps have always been a part of crossfit and crossfit football or like power athletics help you to do those box jumps better so if you followed what they were talking about, and he was one of the early guys that was actually bringing a sports and athletic background into CrossFit. Yeah. And he, he played the NFL. Like, Coach Greg Glassman, you can say what you want about him, but if you put him next to John Wellborn, I know whose team I want to get. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It, it's, yeah, it's super interesting because everything from what's power athlete now or what was CrossFit football mm -hmm. back there – okay, you don't want to do it all day, every day. Some people do. Yeah. But there's only benefit coming into the, the recreational pursuit of CrossFit. Yeah, I think it, um, the, 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 the emphasis on some of the, the stuff that is kind of like power athlete stuff um, is, is super beneficial for like people just doing CrossFit in terms of that it's a almost like a more accessible way of getting better at a certain quality. So you want to get more powerful, but you know, maybe the limiting factor is a beginner is that your technique's not as good on say a power clean, but like if you replace that with, all right, we're going to go sprinting. Like so long as the intent is there, um, you're still going to get sort of these changes and adaptations that make you more powerful. Yeah. Um, even if, you know, all right, we can make your sprint tech be better and you can get faster and stuff like that. But the, the simple fact is that like sprinting is like super potent as like a stimulus to be more powerful. So um, kind of ticking off like, the, I would say like low hanging fruit, like easy options to make yeah. people make them significantly more powerful and get those benefits from doing things that we, yeah, probably don't do as much of mm. in traditional CrossFit programming. It is interesting, isn't it? Because if you take a complex movement, as like you're saying, if you take a complex movement like snatch, 
you can become more powerful at snatching by snatching a lot, mm. or you can become more powerful at snatching by sprinting. Yeah. To a certain, that's almost what you're saying. Like, yeah. I, but it's easier for a lot of people, <laughs> some people, to go and do some sprint and to train that in a movement that is not so alien to them as lifting a barbell to an overhead okay. position. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And even, even I found from my sort of my own training, I kind of left the, the sprint alone, alone for a while um, and then kind of reintroduced it. And it helped me kind of like push through quite a lot of plateaus on just my conventional deadlift. Yeah. Um, made, yeah. I would say it was uh, a real, yeah, a real plateau breaker to, to push me to like next level, like numbers that were, that I was, that I have been chasing for, for kind of years and working mm. towards. Um, yeah, just the, the sprinting is such a high stimulus, such a high output um, that is not so easy to kind of achieve with say just, just a, just a conventional deadlift. Um, there's some, there's kind of like fear and inhibitions there around going heavy. Maybe um, there's a certain skill kind of element to to, to heavy singles. Like mm. you, you know, you you go if you go practice your singles for a while, you get significantly better. It's like, did you actually get that much stronger? Or did you get better at the skill of executing it? Um, and you know, you need to then get up to this kind of like really high level of execution to then get stronger as well. Yeah. Whereas with the sprinting, you you know, as long as the intent is there and you 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 are really sprinting, you you might get that those same adaptations much easier. Yeah, it's very interesting, and, that, and obviously because it's gone, or well, the sport of CrossFit's gone the way it's gone, and therefore, what what we teach downstairs, which is general physical preparedness, is I think is massively influenced. Like if if a lot of those top athletes were were still follow which they were back in the day. A lot of the decent athletes in the games in 2008, 2009 were, were following CrossFit football. I mean, CrossFit football always used to have a big booth at the games and it was the best booth and because yeah. they were just big guys that yeah. were powerful as, as, as anything. And yeah, it's, it's kind of, it's a shame that it's detached because I think people would get more benefit from CrossFit, if those elements were still strong within, yeah, I, yeah, I completely agree with you. Like, there's there's a lot to be said for just uh, generally having exposure to to yeah those plyometric things, mm. uh, the the sprints, those really high output efforts. Um, you know, uh, the if you talk about, if you think about like people's little sort of long-term health um, and their kind of long-term resilience, like having, keeping in a small kind of thread of, of like plyometrics just might be the, the thing that, you know, you get to 16, you stumble and you, the people save themselves from a fall if we're thinking just in terms mm. of like long, long-term yeah. health and, you know, being, keeping people like physically active in, as they get older. Mm. Um, yeah, the, I think the, there's, there's definitely some benefit to have that in there. I think one of the biggest things that's probably sort of cannibalized the whole thing is, is people's obsession with calories. Mm. Because what you're talking about is, especially in, in sprinting, or like is high effort, which needs a lot of recovery. Yeah. And on, on wearables, despite what I spoke about a few shows ago with... with uh, I don't remember his name about wearables that people are constantly looking how many calories a session. Yeah. So if you, it, it, this would actually be a really interesting uh, comparison to do a CrossFit class and then to go and do a sprint session where you might only do 10 efforts within yeah. an hour, if that, Yeah. but they're so, the intensity is so high, your calorie count would be, yeah, Probably under a hundred. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. So people are like, "Well, actually, I'm not, I'm not burning calories." But you're mm. to get the effect that you want from that session. You're recruiting 
every single muscle fiber <laughs> from head to toe, which in a CrossFit class, even when people are doing deadlifts, they're not using, yeah. they're, they're not even using all the muscles in their legs. Yeah. I, um, I, yeah, I think it's, like you said, this kind of obsession with counting calories, but I think uh, trying, to, trying to offset your calories with exercise is kind of a, a road to nowhere. Like I could walk out here and eat a, eat a donut, it's 300 calories, I've got to go run 3K like, to try and, try and <laughs> offset that. Um, so I think to, to try and get people to, to not just see exercise purely as calorie burning mm. see see it for all the other benefits like you know living a long time and having a high quality of life uh, as they get older uh, having like doing exercise to build muscle mass because it supports their immune system it, it keeps their their bones dense so that if they do fall they don't break a hip mm. um, you know doing aerobic aerobic training because of the the benefits of their like cognition for the, like their their mental faculty mm. um rather than kind of this focus on exercise as a means just to just to burn calories yeah, yeah. But that's the thing i mean it's tough isn't it because a lot of big <coughs> fitness companies or interventions have that's what they've based their business model on. Yeah. And so when people are looking for a choice, will I go to Barry's boot camp where they guarantee that I'll burn 500 calories or will I go to a CrossFit class where there's no real guarantee or will I come to a CrossFit class that's more sort of, okay, we're going to do two deadlifts every four minutes at 95% of you on rep max. Yeah. They're like, well, okay, I've only done, and we're only going to do five sets. Yeah. Like, well, I've only done <laughs> 10 lifts today. And yeah, it's an uh, it's, it's interesting one. We've always, I think we've always tried to incorporate as much of sort of power-based movements as possible mm. in, in the program. And at mm. the same time, we've, we've always incorporated a lot of, of unilateral movements as well as bilateral movements yeah. to try and make sure that we're getting people to, to recruit more muscles that they've got and as you said it's longevity as well yeah that we're trying to trying to help them with when you look at your own programming how do you incorporate because you obviously you loved calcio from the start <laughs> <laughs> and 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 you enjoyed but you enjoyed the elements of of crossfit football of power athlete mm -hmm. how do you put and, and your background of sprinting and there's a lot of different things going on. How do you build a program for yourself? Like what, how do you go about it? I'm interested to sort of share that story with people. I, I typically kind of look at program as kind of like reverse engineering from where I want to kind of end up um, and what kind of physical qualities I'm looking to, to develop um, and then try and kind of work back from there as to, to, to where I currently am and, and kind of move on from there. So, you know, what are my kind of long-term goals? So I've got some sort some long-term kind of strength goals that I want to move towards. So they're something that kind of always feature in, in my training. Um, at the moment, kind of just being, I kind of have a good theme of kind of exploring and doing kind of, novel <laughs> novel movements just um just for one my own kind of understanding of them and yeah. you know will this you know understanding these things might will make me a better coach you know kind of learn something that can I can then help use to kind of benefit um a client um or benefit the class um but in terms of yeah my own training kind of general general themes that I keep through keep through it I want to you know, do something long and aerobic during the week, something that's, you know, sustainable. Um, I want to do some, some high effort kind of jumping, kind of these like maximal effort things. Um, just the, gen the general strength stuff. So I've got like a long-term goal for my, for my deadly lift um, that I'm trying to work When you towards. say long-term, how long are we, how longer term are we talking? Um... So well, the the goal is to to get a, to triple body weight on the deadlift. Um, we're probably like three to four years in. 
um, when I first kind of thought, is this doable? So, so at the moment, about 10 kilos shy. So How much do you weigh? 90 kilos. Right. So, to 270. 270. So, yeah, it's been a slow, steady... So we're program. four years into this girl. Yeah. Wow. And I could be patient. <laughs> you're very patient. Yeah, well, it comes back to the planning, doesn't yeah. it? It's yeah. um, and there's been a, there's been a, yeah a few hiccups along the way, but yeah. But what? And, and I mean, when it gets to the pointy end of the stick like that, the beginner gains are <laughs> a, a way out the window. Yeah. So do you do you sort of is there is there a timeline or is it like well, those last kilos should be you know, maybe it could be a year if everything was good, or maybe it's it's going to be three years. Have, have you got, like, a target? There was, <laughs> yeah, the, the kind of target was towards the end of the year, the start of next year. Mm. Um, what I've found is that, obviously, I kind of have, like, phases of where I'll kind of push it quite hard, but the kind of, the amount of fatigue it kind of generates, like, you've got to do you know be like one session like an hour long and it'll be you know, like like we said before only a few only a few lifts yeah um and then afterwards the fatigue's super high you know i i see i see the effect of it uh later on in the in the in the following week and two weeks you know um i typically you i typically do on monday some like some sort of like maximal jumping um and I love deadlifts on the Friday, and then you'll see that my max like vertical jump will be down like four four inches or so, and, wow. and I'm just like that. That is that is the fatigue, and you, you see, you come you know come to do a power clean, and I'm like, God, this is heavy, and it's just you're just so fatigued from from those things. So it tends to be push the 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 training volume and the intensity on the deadlift for a period of time, and then kind of back off it for you know three, four, five weeks, and then kind of sort of a, a new way from a slightly elevated position and just kind of rinse and repeat. I'm, I would say I'm, I, have, I have my kind of general plan and understanding of, of how it will kind of evolve, but it's just not super fixed because mm. um, I tend to go off feel quite a lot. Like I, I, don't, I don't have a, any wearables or anything like that. I just... Like, how do I feel? What does my performance feel like? Like, is something that should be easy really hard? Okay, I must be pretty fatigued. Do I need to adjust my volume and intensity this week to try and kind of let some of that fatigue clear so that then we can train pretty hard again? Um, You know, is that kind of like balancing it out? If you you start on day one of your training at 100% effort, Day two is not going to look like 100% effort. You're mm. probably going to get 100% and then we're going to be 60, 60, 60 for the rest of the week. Can we get uh, 80, 90 or like 80% on day one and then can we get another 80 on day two and three? And then over the whole week and the month, we'll have done more work than we would have done if we'd have just gone yeah. all out day one and then just kind of dropped off the rest of the week. Yeah. Um, so yeah, try and trying to balance that out but yeah how do you mix emotion with that because if something was distracting you emotionally or straining you emotionally then you could you could be susceptible to be brought down and yeah. to start like there's negative self-talk right there's like Absolutely. i'm not making progress uh oh, you know i've been at this for four years and you know, how, how do you navigate that? Yeah, I don't know. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough one. It's kind of... And try and keep, like, the kind of long-term goal in perspective and know that, you know, progress is never going to be linear. Uh, things are going to drop. And then, and yeah, and life is just generally going to happen and that's kind of... take the edge off some some progress at times, but... I um, just kind of always come back to the consistency. Like, if you keep showing up and, and putting in effort and hard work and you've got a kind of a plan and a structure of where you're going to go with things, like, 
kind of just trust trust in the plan kind of kind of thing. Um, That's awesome. Yeah. How do you? How does that carry over? You obviously have been training people for a long time, mate. And here you you do personal training with people. A lot of, not a lot, but a lot of people who come for personal training are like, <laughs> I'm at A, I want to get to B, I've got X amount of time. And you've demonstrated and, and we've spoken about it on the show for, for a number of <coughs> years. You said it before, like life's not linear. Mm. Things come up, go down, injuries work, life happens. Mm. And you get a client for an hour, two or three times a week. So this sort of, I guess it's your coaching philosophy of, okay, what's our long-term plan? How do you work with your clients in an age where most of them, and this is not a bad thing, this is just how we're programmed. They'll come in and they're like, right, I want 10 sessions and this is what I'm looking for. Yeah, it's, 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 it's hard. Um it's almost, uh, I think, like the conversations that you have with clients ongoing is super important. That um, almost to try and like manage their expectations and uh, try and maybe, in some cases, maybe reframe their goals that are just a little bit more realistic. It's almost like you, you can't sort of like hack biology. You can't. <laughs> You can't make someone pregnancy be go from nine months to, to to six months just because you want it to happen faster. Unfortunately, this 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 same sort of rules still apply. Like you can get good progress in there um, by training hard and working, but a lot of times these things are still gonna gonna take time. Um, but I think trying to uh, help the clients understand that and kind of manage their expectations but then also within the sessions you know try and show them like tangible progress um because like it wasn't like people people don't people don't quit stuff when they're not making progress mm. like if you're if you're making progress and you're getting better at something then most of the time you're going to keep doing it if you can unless you know there's some really extenuating circumstances so Trying to trying to set up personal training and, and training with people in such a way that as they train, I can show them it's okay. So week one you did this, and on week six we kind of retested it, and this is your progress, and you can kind of see that. I think um, it's super important to almost get like buy in, and then they can you know you you don't notice it yourself week to week, month to month, your progress on those kind of things. But when you've got some sort of like hard facts and data like yeah. alright this is what you did and this is what you've done now it's like oh right I am I am making progress and I can you know hopefully understand that I've just got to keep being consistent and keep applying that kind of effort um, and okay maybe my maybe my 10 week transformation was <laughs> maybe a little unrealistic um so yeah, I think I think com good conversations with people within yeah. sessions is, is super important for that. Yeah, it's true, and like you said, one of the benefits of of strength training, and you said it when you're sixty or seventy, just a little uneven ground, and and, and you'll break a bone. Mm. Whereas the work that we're doing now on ourselves or, or, or with people is actually making our bones stronger. I, I have a friend and 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 his partner has uh, quite aggressive osteoporosis mm. and literally can break a bone getting in a car. Yeah. And not, not falling into the car, just like getting into twisting. a car, just a twist and a bone will snap. Yeah. And there's a reason why it, it's come to that and uh, which is, you know, is not super relevant right now. But the point is, is that we can, have, we can help people avoid that and there's yeah. no... There's no real, there are those measurables, like you said, on a, on a weekly, monthly basis of some progress, but these kind of things of, of actual good general health and vitality, <laughs> you sit here and say, yeah, in 20 years, you, you won't snap a leg getting yeah. out of bed. <laughs> People laugh, but it's, it's very true what you said. Oh, yeah. 100%, like, you know, if we're thinking, what are the, what are the big things, like, for long-term health? Yeah. It's like, 
you you want to be reasonably aerobically fit. That will help with your brain, heart, lungs, circulation. You want to have some some a little bit of muscle mass. That's going to be like super protective in terms of developing metabolic diseases. Um, that muscle mass is also going to mean you know you've probably done some sort of resistance training, so your bones are a little bit more dense. You're less likely to break them. Um, that muscle mass is also supportive for your immune system as well. So having those things and then just being somewhat strong so that you can actually like get up out of a chair and those kinds of things, um, you know, ticking all those kind of things off. And th- those are the kinds of things that we, we try to tick off in the class as well. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, making people a bit stronger, making them more aerobically fit, um, giving them some like sort of hypertrophy training, like to build some muscle mass. Those are all things that, are going to mean that, you know, when they're 70 years old, they can still play with their grandkids and look after themselves and they're not in a nursing home. Um, mm. yeah. It's just a lot harder to put that into an Instagram post. That's why yeah. we're doing a podcast. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, it's 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 so true. I mean, the amount of ailments, the increasing amount of ailments that we're seeing and, and, and sick people mm. in... 60 years plus sort of age bracket and if you think about how that they actually might have done a little bit of training and they haven't eaten as much processed food as people 35 have eaten Mm. so what are the 35 year olds going to look like in 25 years yeah it's going to be it's pretty grim it's going to be a mess (laughs) We'll keep the gym open. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Mate, obviously through through your coaching and through your time, you've not only written programs and and had this long term and this quite big vision for your own programming, but back in the UK and, and now here, you've written programs or you're writing programs for for the public, for a gym. You're writing our, our mainline class. Yeah. You've done the same back in the UK. How do you do it when I'm not saying it's easy for you because it's just you, mm. but now you're taking into consideration all sorts of different people, males, females, athletic backgrounds, zero. I mean, and we get it. People haven't done anything since school and they're yeah. now 42. You know, we've had almost 25 years hiatus on, on, on physical exercise. So what's your... You've got this amazing way of looking at your own training. I'm interested to see what the amazing way of looking at developing a program for a larger population that has so many different abilities and needs and goals. Yeah, it's uh, it's tough. <laughs> it's tough. I, uh, I've always I've always maintained that writing like a good group program is much harder than writing an individual you've got like you said you've got to consider all these different abilities mm. that kind of stuff um i typically try and look at it as like what kind of physical qualities do i want them to get out of the ses- session um so you know is this is this a uh, kind of strength based are we looking for you know when we're doing like work that's kind of interval based, well, if we're trying to, if the session's kind of, the focus is trying to be a little bit more aerobic, then we want some kind of repeat, repeatability. It's like, can you get the same score every time? Like, do you understand your own like gears and pacing for stuff like that? Um, to try and kind of look at it from what the outcome we want, we want. And then can we then scale things maybe up and down for people's um, ability and kind of meet them where they currently are. Um, and then it's like, we want to kind of meet them where they are and then we want to give them kind of a little, some sort of physical challenge like that allows them to develop and progress and, and get a little bit better. Um, so like simple things is kind of like, well, um, in this workout, what sort of what sort of time frame do we want them to be spending on this or that, and then mm. scale scale distances or kind of calories that we might be using to to allow everyone to kind of get the same sort of stimulus. Um, 
And then in terms of like over, over the week, we're trying to get um, something kind of long and, and aerobic. We're trying to get some, some heavy stuff in there. Um, some some stuff to kind of develop the skills because we're still it's still although we've got maybe a more GPP bias it's still a CrossFit gym and we still want to try and keep people like learning and developing new skills and yeah and it's new fun ability. to be able to do a ring muscle up exactly yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's cool yeah like giving people like novel challenges you know yeah like you said. Being, being being athletic is being able to kind of solve movement problems. So yeah. let's give people new movement pro- problems to try and figure out and solve. Um, yeah, and we want we want some some real hard effort intensity as well during the week. And trying to just balance all of those all of those out. Those are trying those are my kind of like key kind of tick boxes throughout the week. Like, can we hit all these kind of things? Um, uh, for each person, like how how can we get there by you know having some general idea of how we're going to scale it, and then obviously the coaching staff here are all super experienced and can then make more kind of refined adjustments so that people get the most out of their out of their training session, um, and then over the course of you know six eight weeks, all right, the, these are kind of our big rocks that we're kind of try and improve. I'm, I'm not a huge believer in trying to improve everything all at once. Mm. And like, all right, we're going to spin the plates on these three things while we try and make these two things better. Um, so over the course of the, the month, all right, in week one, we got this kind of total volume of, of strict pulling, of strict pull-ups in. And the following week, we got a little bit more volume and a little bit more volume. And then can we then take that volume and the, that you've kind of built up in the skill? Can we then like feed that through into workouts? Because we know it's one thing doing pull-ups when you're fresh. It's quite another thing doing pull-ups when your heart rate's 180. So can we then kind of filter this through to make people just generally more proficient at all these kind of things? I have to ask you because I think it's coming hell week Mm -hmm. would you not would you put Cal Sue in (laughs) (laughs) knowing that and that's why I started with that question actually because we've all done well not all but some of us have done some quite hard workouts that we remember if you were to pick You've got one workout for the next hell week. Have you thought, maybe you already know what it's going to be, but I mean, this is what we generally do every time anyway. We get all the coaches and then try and figure out how we can yeah. put them together. What would be a nasty workout or a hard workout that you've done or that you've seen, preferably done, because I think if we're going to give stuff to people, we should have always yeah. done it, that would go into hell week now and would would have that repeatability that you spoke about ongoing. So I've I've always thought the um, as like uh, you know if we're looking at this through a lens of like yeah it's a hell week and it wants to be really difficult but then can we repeat it and what does it represent as a test? I always thought the workout Jerry was great. So one mile run, two k row, one mile run. Wow, like like superb benchmark in terms yeah. of like your aerobic fitness um a good one for like some mental toughness like it's gonna it's gonna hurt yeah. That's it, off the back of that 2k row into that that it sounds so simple as well yeah. doesn't it yeah like elegant uh super simple there's there's no there's no roadblocks in there this is just like okay this is just how fit are you um you know can you go run really hard and then get onto the rower, row really hard and then go run again? Like, there's no, there's no limiter of like a skill. Like, all oh, right, my my bar muscles aren't quite there yet. Um, and then in terms of like, we can just come back and do this again in six months' time. Yeah. Like, compared to then, have you got more aerobically fit? Which uh, a little bit off topic, but which endurance coach? would you back yourself beating at that workout? 
Oh God! <laughs> uh, I think we, we, we. I'm just about to tease something up here by the sounds of things. Um, oh God! I don't know. They're all uh, they're all pretty fit, aren't they? Um, I'm just trying to figure out the distance that they'd make on you because you can run as well. I can run, but I can't run like they can run. <laughs> yeah, think. but I mean, 1.6k. So they're going to do that. 20 seconds faster than you max. Yeah. I just need to, I need to, I need to know what people's rowing times are like. That's my, uh, I that's think my you chance. should. Should I challenge the other Dan? The Dan's, actually, that's a terrible choice. He's, he's rapid. <laughs> he's, he's really rapid. quick at running. <laughs> yeah, he's <right>. really <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, but he's going to, he's, he's only going to make up 30 seconds on you in the run. So you now need to row at about, <laughs> yeah, it's it's an interesting one because if you rode at about one forty, that it, yeah, he would row at about one fifty. Yeah, but you need to make up. It's a minute. Yeah, it's a thirty lot. at each end. Yeah, it's a lot of time to make up. It's not sharp. maybe skinny. Maybe yeah. That's, I not. wonder if skinny could row two k at sub two minutes to five hundred. There we go. That's my only. That's my only chance. <laughs> that's basically what it, almost what it has to be. Yeah. All right, well. That could be a good one. So we'll have Jerry in and we'll have an endurance. Uh, yeah, a little I think all endurance clients against all CrossFit clients. <laughs> yeah, that'd be fun. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but it's, it's, it's super interesting. And it's interesting how a workout like that is so good within a program because it's not 150 war balls day one, a load of deadlifts day two, a load of thrusters day three. Yes, it, it does need your legs. But like you said, what we're testing there is purely your aerobic system. How high can you get your heart rate and keep it there for... Uh, Twelve? Maybe twelve minutes? No, that's too fast. Yeah, that's too... Uh, yeah. Fifteen. Yeah. What, what's a good time for that workout? Or what time have you done it in? Oh, God. I can't remember. It's, it's been, what, like... Like years. six six years ago, I think I took it quite steady on the row. I think I pushed the I pushed the pace on the on the run, cruisier pace on the on the on five the row to then run, try and push yeah, it's the run. Definitely not twelve minutes. Yeah, anything like sub, I think anything sub, sub twenty sub twenty is uh, be, uh, is, pretty, uh, is is respectable. Yeah, I think I forgot about the second run there. <laughs> uh, I'll do it with just one run. Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's uh, it's so Jerry. Jerry's the man. Yeah. I think Mate, so. before we wrap up, how many times since have you done Kelsey? Uh, only, only once. Oh, only once. repeatability. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Will we see it in the class program? Uh, maybe in maybe another hell week now we've spoken about we've it. We've seen it. Yeah. We've seen it a few times. In the past. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there we go. Just on, a, on random days as well, <laughs> not not in a hell week, not on a. Okay. Uh, because it's such a. I mean, and you can do it. You can do it with anything, right? You can do a hundred cleans. Yeah. You do, a hundred deadlifts is a bit next, but I've seen <laughs> it done with that. Five burpees on the minute. It's such a. Where does the word calcio come from? Uh, Isn't I think it Finnish or something. Yeah, I think. Um, the, this could show our like old school CrossFit knowledge, Miko, Miko Salo. Mm. Yeah, so, uh, something like like stoic resolve in the face of adversity or something like that. I think it's uh, everyone should have to watch Miko Salo documentaries. Yeah, I take the rower that they gave me at the games and I put it in the cupboard. <laughs> Then I row. <laughs> yeah. That's why he won a, a concept two at the games, <laughs> and he took it took it home. And the only place he had for it was a was a cupboard. Yeah, so he put it in there and just did intervals in there. Yeah, he's he, uh, just a savage. Just a uh, yeah, a tough man. tough guy. Yeah, I think Holly <laughs> does the Miko triangle more times than I think she should. She'll do it at least four or five times a year. Well, I've, uh, I've I've been jumping in. Jess has been doing it in the uh, in her engine program. Yeah. So we did uh, we did some over unders on it on uh, on Wednesday night. So two calories over on your first round, two yeah. calories under in your second round. Yeah. That was a little little gut check towards the end. That'd be decent. 
Yeah, it was fun. It was fun session. It was hard. So still same forty minutes. Yeah, same forty minutes. But your first round was establish a baseline in the first week, and then first round two calories underneath your baseline, and then second round two calories over your baseline. Um, savage. Yeah, it was savage. The ski, the ski was tough. Folks, if that's your jam, this guy <laughs> is the guy. <laughs> Jump to Jess's engine class as well for those more uh, aerobic ones. But mate, thank you. That's an interesting conversation. We could uh, we could talk for a lot more time about programming, and I think that's that's the interesting thing when it comes to programming and goals. It's it is a, a huge conversation, and if we could encourage friends, clients, members, call yourselves whatever you, or just listeners of the show, anything is to have that quite global, zoomed out view on what you're doing and, and where's it taking. And I think my biggest takeaway is how do I feel at 60? Yeah. It's what we're writing now. It's we're writing that. how we feel at 60. Yeah, absolutely. Dan, thank you very much. Appreciate yes, it. Thanks for having me.